For my service learning project, I was given the opportunity to volunteer at Landsake Farm in Weston. Landsake was founded in 1980 by a small group of farmers who wanted to institutionalize sustainable public land stewardship and inspire land-loving people to celebrate and preserve the historical agriculture heritage in the town. This group included Doug Henderson, Martha Google, and Brian Donahue. This group's first project was to improve trail maintenance in the woods of Weston, and by the spring of 1981, they began farming the land at the Case 40 Acre Field. In 1985, when Harvard University decided to sell the Case 40 Acre Field, Landsake led the effort to save the land from development. They developed a coalition of community groups who came together and galvanized town voters to purchase the land. Over the years, Landsake has worked with Western Public Schools and others such as Brandeis University as part of a long tradition of agricultural education in Westing. These educational programs began in the Hillcrest Gardens of Marion Case, where boys learned farming and horticulture skills starting in 1909. Hillcrest was located at the current estates of Arnold Abortum in Weston. Here is a quick timeline of land sake and land preservation in Weston. During my volunteering, I worked closely with Anna Cohen, who is the lead educator at Lansing Farm. Anna trained me on all the aspects of animal care, such as feeding, changing the water, and cleaning the cages and coops for the chickens and rabbits. When I was volunteering working in the garden, my activities included weeding, bed maintenance, field maintenance, and cutting back invasive plants. Along with this, I was also able to volunteer by harvesting local firewood. Since the early 1980s, Landsake has provided a model for small-scale sustainable forestry. Working with the Weston Conservation Commission, each winter we harvest firewood from different parcels of Weston's conservation land to improve the quality of the remaining stand, then sell this firewood over the summer to local residents. Each year, we harvest up to 40 cords of wood from Weston's conservation land and allow it to naturally season over the spring and summer. Lastly, I helped by collecting sap from hundreds of maple trees throughout Weston with teams of middle school students and volunteers from the community. We then boiled the sap in an evaporator fired by our own firewood to remove the water from the sap. This creates a beautiful amber-colored syrup. Each year, we produce anywhere from 50 to 70 gallons of maple syrup, which we then bottle and sell through our farm stand. Here is a video of how it's done. All right, so this is a hard maple tree. Now, you don't want to tap soft maple trees. You don't want to tap uh, Japanese maple trees or really uh, anything but the hard maple because the hard maple will produce a really sweet sap for you. And the hard maple is defined by this really tight bark that holds just really close to the uh, to the main tree here. And this is an example of a soft maple. Now when you see the soft maple, as you can see, there's no blocks, there's no bark. It's just pretty smooth with some very small, just kind of mini chip-like bark. It's not, it's not like the other kind of flaky, large chunked bark that you see. And this is a soft maple. This does not make good maple syrup. Now, the best way to tap a maple tree is to, once you find your hard maple, you want to look at the south-facing side. Now, the south-facing side gets quite a bit of shade during midday, so I typically will go in between um, the east and the south. So, you know, 
this portion of the tree. So that's why I chose this section because it's going to get the most amount of sun because the optimal time to actually tap your maple trees is February and March. When your nights get in the high 20s and the days get in the high 30s to low 40s, that's when the sap is running the best and that's when you're going to get the most um, maple sap for the time that you're spent tapping your trees. So I'm going to actually go through kind of some uh, tapping rules now. When you tap a tree, you don't want to tap a maple tree that's less than 18 inches in diameter. And the way you can tell the diameter of your tree is by taking one of those flexible measuring tapes that the seamstresses use to measure your waistline and whatnot. You want to wrap that all the way around the tree and then divide that by two and that's your diameter of your tree. So anything below 18 inches you want to wait to, till it gets bigger or find a different tree and anything over 18 inches, you're allowed one tap per tree. This tree is 39 inches in diameter. It's a huge tree, it's a massive tree. So with 39 inches, I'm allowed six taps. And that is the most that you're gonna to wanna to tap a tree, no more than six. It doesn't matter if you have a tree at 100 inches in diameter, you don't wanna tap a tree more than six taps. All right, so before you start tapping your tree, you're going to want to get a bit that is 5 16 inch. This is a little bit smaller because I'm actually going to drill a pilot hole first and then I actually have my 5 16 bit right here. And you want to make a mark. You don't want to go into the tree any more than one and a half inches deep. Otherwise you start going into the heartwood of the tree and that's going to uh, allow for diseases to get in the tree and potentially kill it. Which is another kind of common courtesy thing that you want to do to your tree. You want it to heal. Because the, the hole will be small enough that it won't hurt the tree and it'll just heal right over. So I have marked one and a half inches right here. And then on my bit actually, I don't know if you can see it, but I have a, I have a mark right there at one and a half inches. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna find where you're gonna tap your tree. I have my line already set up and this, I'm only doing one tap. I'm just gonna tap it into this for now until I get a five gallon bucket. But um, I just have my tap line set up kind of where I wanna tap it first and that allows you to see kind of how it's gonna run. And then what you're gonna do is you're just going to, I think I'm actually gonna tap it right here. You're going to stick your drill in straight and tip it down just a little bit. If your drill has a measuring bubble like mine does, you wanna make sure that it's not level. You want it to be slightly slanted upward so the sap runs down. And so I'm just gonna slowly start my pilot hole here. turned out really good. All right, and there's already, wow, there's already lots of sap flown out. All right, so now I actually have my, my 5 16 inch bit in, and there's already sap flowing out of this baby, but I'm just gonna drill this really quick. And just kind of clear away the debris. You don't want a whole lot of debris because it's going to allow for quite a bit of disease to come into the tree. So, blow your hole out. Now what you're gonna take is your tap. This is called a spile. You can get these for pretty very cheap online. And the end you wanna insert into the tree is the long end. And you don't wanna insert it all the way. You wanna insert it just until you hear it thud. When you hear it thud, it means it hit the end of the hole and you're only gonna to wanna to put it in that far. Any further and it's gonna split this, it's gonna leak, and it's also gonna hurt the tree. So what you're just gonna do is you're gonna find where you drilled your hole here and insert it, take a hammer and just lightly tap. And just make sure that the There we go. Alright, and as you can see, after about 30 seconds, you're gonna have all that fresh maple sap dripping right out of your tap and that is how you Lansing is supported by the local government in that we can advocate for what our needs are and propose changes such as our new long-term lease but we do not have the authority to grant these decisions on our own they must be passed through the existing structure of the local government using standard government practices
The federal government is not as closely involved with Lansing as the local government, but it affects us due to the regulations that it puts out. For example, when we are to decide how to treat different problems organically, it is the federal government that regulates which methods are considered organic or not. We also are involved with the state government for some things, such as when we tested our chickens to make sure that they are free of sal salmonella and avian influenza. Landsake works closely with the Western Conservation Commission. The Western Conservation Commission contracts Landsake to do the work that we do with separate contracts for different activities, such as firewood production and trail maintenance. We also work with the Board of Health for permitting and licensing to ensure that we are following safe standards.